You've heard the word avatar, but do you really know what it means? Is it some kind of modern term or is it an ancient mystical concept? Find out on this episode of Revealing the True Light. Do you know what the word avatar means? Is it just some kind of modern word that some geeky person in Silicon Valley dreamed up? Or is it an ancient mystical concept that has ripple effects on into this modern era? Well, we're going to find out on this program. Actually, there are four primary things that the word avatar relates to. And we're going to explore all four of them. Let's dig into this right now. Most people relate to the movie, The Avatar, when they think of this term. And what was that movie all about? I've never seen it. I've seen a lot of advertisements about it. It was a blockbuster movie released in 2009 that has a sequel coming out just in a couple of days. And The Avatar is a human named Jack Sully, who was a quadriplegic soldier, whose consciousness was transferred into a body resembling the Navi, a race of bluish, purplish kind of uh, beings that occupied a world called Pandora. And I believe I got all of those details right. Having never seen the movie, I uh, don't know absolutely all the details of how the whole drama unfolds. But I do know that apparently the Navi have a strong connection to Ewa. And Ewa is their guiding force and their deity. It's like the force, the life force that flows through all of creation in this world as New Agers conceive it, as Hindus conceive it. And so it's really introducing a Hindu New Age concept within a different set of uh, ideas and storylines, right? So anyway, uh, all the, the Navi can connect with this life force through their antennas, through neuroconnective antennas. Wow. And these antennae, can tie into something called the Tree of Souls, which is a location that provides a strong link to Ewa and allows the Navi to communicate with their ancestors. So can you see how these concepts are being introduced to children and teenagers that watch these movies to draw them away from any kind of biblical worldview into believing that you can contact the dead, believing that you can penetrate a spiritual world with the right kind of uh, approach, mystical approach. Uh, but anyway, the Navis uh, can also, through a risky ritual, transfer consciousness from one body to another. And that's what allowed Jack Sully to transfer his consciousness from this quadriplegic body into a body that looked like the Navi, so he could infiltrate that culture. And he's reborn as a Navi, in a sense, later on, uh, when he opens his eyes. A pretty amazing storyline. I'm sure it's captivating for those who enjoy that kind of movie. Now, that introduced the term avatar to a whole generation that never would have known about it otherwise, except for the fact it also relates to this kind of practice online, on Facebook or various online games where you choose an image, you choose a representative avatar as the entity or the individual in a game or on Facebook that represents you in giving ideas or being involved in the process of the game. You have this avatar, which is like an alter ego. And so a lot of people relate to the word because of their use of an avatar when they do online things. However, in Hinduism, 
An avatar is an incarnation of God or an incarnation of a deity. And so it has ancient roots. It's a mystical term that is celebrated within New Age spirituality as well. And I read a definition on yogainternational.com that really sums it up well. And so I'm going to read it to you. The extent to which the word avatar has been devalued is best revealed by an organization in the United States that trains people to become avatars. Now, this is the fourth way the word is used. It's, of course, a part of Hindu doctrine, but it's also been used in this uh, course that is provided to people. And you'll be surprised uh, what they claim to be able to do. Let me read it again. The extent to which the word avatar has been devalued is best revealed by an organization in the United States that trains people to become avatars, giving them their own avatar number when they complete the course. And this group has additional training to turn people into avatar masters who are then certified to train other people to become avatars. Exactly what avatar means to them is best revealed by a third training course, which claims to turn avatar masters into wizards. Thus, an avatar is an, only an understudy for a wizard. Strangely, ironically, one of the people who give their testimonies on our website, our comparative religion website, the truelight.net, was a very renowned teacher of the Avatar course before he became a follower of Jesus. He also studied under an Indian guru, a very famous Indian guru, and lived in an ashram in India for many years and finally had this powerful encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ that transformed his life and his worldview dramatically. But he was a teacher with the Avatar course, so he's very well familiar with this. In fact, we just published or republished his book. His name is Michael Graham, and he has a book called From Guru to God, and it was published through Deeper Revelation Books, a very intriguing book because he goes very deeply into the belief system he once held to when he was a yoga advocate and when he was a teacher of the uh, the Avatar course. Now, let's go back to Hinduism. I want to camp on Hinduism for a while and really develop this concept as it is found in the Hindu worldview and in their ancient sacred literature. In Hinduism, there are, well, there's supposed to be 10 major avatars. Uh, the word Avatar instantly comes from a Sanskrit word that means descent. And of course, the implication is a deity descends down into the natural realm in an embodied form. And there have been supposedly 10 avatars of Vishnu. Vishnu is at the top of the pantheon of gods in Hinduism. There are 330 million gods in Hinduism. That's the traditional number. But there's something called the Hindu triad, which are the three primary deities. And one is Brahma, who is supposedly the creator god. Shiva is the destroyer god. And Vishnu is the preserver god much different than the trinity or the triune nature of the one God as found biblically in Christianity. Much, much different. You cannot compare the two. But the belief in Hinduism is that Vishnu has incarnated in this world ten times, or actually nine times in the past and one time yet in the future. And I'm going to give you the whole list. Number one, Vishnu was incarnated as a fish. The first avatar was a fish. The second avatar, and the fish instantly was called Matsya. And the second avatar was a turtle called Kurma. The third avatar was a boar named Varaha. The fourth avatar was a mixture of human and animal, a man lion named Narasinga. 
The fifth avatar was the dwarf, the sixth Parashurama, uh, the seventh Rama, the eighth Krishna, which is a deity more people are familiar with because George Harrison especially popularized the knowledge of Krishna when he wrote that song, My Sweet Lord, and the Hare Krishna Society, uh, International Society for Krishna Consciousness, Ishkan, really blossomed in the 70s, in the latter 60s, and there were thousands of people turning to Krishna devotion. But Krishna was supposedly the eighth avatar. And then strangely and ironically, Buddha is listed as the ninth avatar. However, Buddha taught against many Hindu concepts. Hindus believe you have a soul named Atman that passes from one incarnation to the next. Buddha taught that human beings have no soul. They have five parts that disassemble at death called skandhas. Buddha also was basically atheistic in his worldview and taught that, uh, that exploring and examining the concept of God can be a hindrance to enlightenment and advised against it and taught against all the pantheon of deities in Hinduism, and yet they named Buddha as the ninth avatar. Why would the ninth avatar refute the very system of belief that that concept comes out of? Very strange. And then the 10th avatar is supposedly an avatar named Kalki, K-A-L-K-I, who is the next world teacher, the Messiah-like figure that will bring healing to this world, who is destined to appear or forecast to appear in 425,000 years from now. And uh, that leaves a lot of time for this world to descend into even greater chaos, right? However, many, many gurus that have come from India, yogis and swamis, have claimed to be avatars. However, in traditional Hinduism, there can only be one avatar in the world at a time. And yet there's several gurus that live simultaneously like Mehir Baba and, and Sai Baba, who was a very famous guru in India. Incidentally, there was a book written about Sai Baba by a man who later became a Christian, but followed Sai Baba and became one of his closest disciples. And that book was called Avatar of Night. Avatar of Night by Tal Brook. Tal Brook passed away just recently, but he headed up spiritual counterfeit projects for many, many years. And uh, I've heard, I've never read that book, but I've heard it's a very good expose of the false claim to quote unquote messiahship or uh, the false claim to avatarship that Sai Baba made, or at least his followers celebrated him as an incarnation. Now, part of the reason some Hindus explain that there can be so many different avatars when the next avatar is not supposed to be here for over 400,000 years is because, according to Hinduism, there can be partial avatars and complete avatars. Now, a lot of the gurus that claim to be an avatar would not exactly appreciate being called a partial avatar, though. But that's how they kind of reconcile the conflicting ideas. Many New Agers have absorbed this idea of an avatar. And many New Agers predict that the second coming of Christ is the same idea promoted in different religions under different banners. For instance, in Islam, you've got the Imam Mahdi that is supposed to make an appearance on the world scene in the near future. Then in Buddhism, you have the fifth Buddha, Maitreya, the Buddha of love that is supposed to emerge in the near future. Then, of course, the Jews are looking for their Messiah, those who have not accepted Yeshua or Jesus as the Messiah. And Christians are looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to return. And then Hindus talk about Kalki coming in the future to bring healing to this world and wholeness and perfection and God consciousness. 
uh, and they say New Agers tend to group all of these together and say they're all talking about the same individual. They're all talking about the same person who will be a world teacher, who will bring healing to the planet. But there's too much contradiction. There's way too much contradiction between the different descriptions of the different uh, uh, individuals I've just described for all of them to be the same. And, and you've got other religions too, like in Zoroastrianism, the third savior, Seoshiant, is supposed to come and restore the world sometime in the future. So you have this messianic kind of view of the future where there's going to be an individual that's going to unify the people of this world and bring heaven to earth. Well, that's only going to happen when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back again. And yet, this avatar concept is supposedly reflected in all these different worldviews. But again, when you inspect those worldviews, there's certain details that throw a rod in that being true that they're all referring to the same person. Because by the way, the Imam Mahdi in the Muslim faith comes, according to their teaching, about, I think it's seven to nine years before Jesus returns. So how could they be the same person? Of course not. They're not. And and I would, of course, promote the idea that Jesus, if you want to use a Hindu term, and I'll only use it momentarily, Jesus, I believe, is the only quote-unquote avatar who has ever come into this world. I would never use that term in reference to him, but he's the only time God has incarnated in human flesh. He certainly didn't come as a fish. He certainly did not come as a turtle. He certainly did not come as a dwarf. He came as a Jewish man who Paul said was God manifested in the flesh. Think of that. Paul said, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, received up into glory. What a wonderful thing that when God incarnated in human flesh, he felt our infirmities, he preached on our level, he gave us the gospel, the good news, he told us how we could come back into oneness with the Father, and then he departed the world and sent the Holy Spirit to dwell in the hearts of the disciples on the day of Pentecost. And that's a completely different approach than what you find in Eastern religions and in New Age spirituality that teaches that there's a spark of divinity within every human being. So to find God, you look within. But when Jesus departed from the world, this one they would say was just another avatar he said that the Holy Spirit would be sent, and it came 10 days after he left, and enter into them. Completely different perspective. Either God's already inside of you, or God is external and will enter into you. And the only way that can happen is if your sins have been washed away by the precious blood of Jesus. And that's when you're born again, and the Spirit of God comes to live and dwell within you. And then you can go on from that point to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which many times um, is awesomely associated with the gift of speaking in tongues, which is a prayer language that is an ecstatic, joyous language of worship to God. That's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But you need to be born again, and then you need to meet this one called Jesus, Yeshua, who was the embodiment of the divine. In fact, the Bible says very clearly that the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. And then Paul went on to say, you are complete in him. See, if Jesus was full of the fullness of the Godhead, so much so that he said, he who has seen me has seen my father. So if you want to see the love of God, Look at Jesus. It's reflected in him. If you want to see the peace of God personified, look at the life of Jesus. It's revealed in him. If you want to see the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God, the power of God, the authority of God, the humility of God, the kindness of God, the compassion of God, all those traits and many others 
were reflected in the Lord Jesus Christ when he walked on the earth. I know there's even some who claim to be Christian who relegate Jesus to an inferior position and are somewhat shocked if you dare to say that he was God. But in the book of Acts, I believe it's Acts 28, 20, or close to that verse, uh, it says that we are the church of God, which he has purchased with his own blood. If there is a scripture that reveals the fact that Jesus was absolutely the manifestation of the Father in this world, it is that scripture out of the book of Acts, that we are the church of God, which he has cleansed and washed and prepared for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit with his own precious blood. So we've covered all the ideas about what it is, what an avatar really is. Now, of course, an avatar can be a representative image that people use to represent them uh, on Facebook or some other online game. And I'm sure people will continue to use that term for that kind of application. And many people will be going to the Avatar, the movie this week, and think that that word is primarily a reference to Jack Sully, uh, the main character in the movie who becomes one of the Navi. And so they, they'll be oblivious to the fact that this is a term with very strong religious and spiritual implications. And Hindus will dare to say that there have been 10, but I dare to declare there's only been one because only Jesus died for the sins of humanity. Only Jesus was born of a virgin. Only Jesus absorbed the sin of the entire human race. Only Jesus was born again. Only Jesus is coming back again to restore this planet to its beautiful, pristine paradise state in the beginning. And I believe that's going to happen in the near future. Now, a couple of announcements I want to make. First of all, I have an article in, in Search of the True Life. My main comparative religion book that I wrote back around 2003, it was first uh, published then. It compares over 20 religions, and there is an article on page 206 that says, was Jesus one of many avatars, or was he the only incarnation of God? It goes into much greater detail than what I've shared on this podcast. Also, I want you to be sure and download your free copy of The Highest Adventure Encountering God. In this little booklet, I share my testimony, how I was a teacher of yoga and meditation at four universities. I ran a yoga ashram before becoming a follower of the Lord Jesus. And this is absolutely free. It's available in eight languages, about to be available in 11 languages. Very soon, I'll be posting it in French and in the Thai language and also a couple of other languages from India. It's on thetruelight.net. So be sure to go to thetruelight.net, download your free copy of In The Highest Adventure, Encountering God, and order your copy of In Search of the True Light. Thank you for being with me.